This is the Gospel Feast Podcast for those that need a little meat after the milk. It's time to feast on the Word. We are continuing our studies of the book of Jonah. We've touched on some of the preliminaries that we need, uh, understanding the plan of salvation, and also understanding a little bit more of Eastern thinking. Now it's time to dive into who was Jonah. The book of Jonah is a small four-chapter book. I mean, you can read the entire thing in under 20 minutes. For this reason alone, Jonah has been called one of the minor prophets of the Old Testament. Of the many who have used his life to teach sermons, there is none greater than our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Indeed, Jonah's life and mission takes on profound meaning when studied in connection with the life and mission of Jesus Christ. So let's begin with the New Testament and work back towards the Old Testament and see the wealth that lies in Jonah's simple four chapters. Reed, let's dive in. I think that's a great place to start. What a great idea. Jesus was an enigma in his day. Looking from our lofty perch at his life 2,000 plus years after his ascension, it is easy to judge his contemporaries as being arrogant, stupid, and misguided in their treatment of the Son of God. And in truth, many were. Still, the anger that has been taken out on the Jewish people for the choices of their ancestors borders on insanity. The Jews as a people have suffered much at the hands of self-righteous Christians who, having wept over the treatment of their Lord, have wanted to even the score, so to speak. It is difficult to read his treatment in the Gospels and not come away annoyed at the failing of his kin to embrace him. Later Jewish mockery of Christian doctrine and Jesus in their Talmuds did not help the situation. It is important to note that the experience was deeply hard on the Lord as well. It is comforting to think that he, knowing all and being God, was above the pain of the slander, torture, and mockery of his peers. But the reverse is actually true. Jesus wept many times over his nation and their unbelief. A fascinating peek into his mindset during his ministry was given to the prophet Joseph Smith. In speaking of his experience, the Lord told the young prophet, Doctrine and Covenants 133.46 And it shall be said at my second coming, Who is it that cometh down from God in heaven with dyed garments, yea, from the regions which are not known, clothed in his glorious apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? And he shall say, I am he who spake in righteousness, mighty to save. And the Lord shall be red in his apparel, and his garments like him that treadeth in the wine vat. And so great shall be the glory of his presence, that the sun shall hide his face in shame, and the moon shall withhold its light, and the stars shall be hurled from their places. And his voice shall be heard, I have trodden the winepress alone, and have brought judgment upon all people, and none were with me. And I have trampled them in my fury, and I have tread upon them in mine anger, and their blood have I sprinkled upon my garments, and stained all my raiment. For this was the day of vengeance which was in my heart." This is an eye-opening passage, Peter. From the Lord's own lips, we have his internal dialogue at the time of his rejection. Being the rightful king, a man of perfect righteousness, innocent before the nations, it pained him to be rejected, mocked, tortured, and killed. He did not deserve it. Inside his heart, hidden from the arrogance of his enemies, he longed for justice, and to use his own words, he longed for vengeance. Even so, he said, glory be to the Father, and he did the Father's will on earth. His is true humility. Those who felt justified using his holy name to punish later Jewry would have done well to remember the Lord's comment to Zechariah at the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah 1.15 But I am very angry with the other nations that are now enjoying peace and security. I was only a little angry with my people, but the nations inflicted harm on them far beyond my intentions. Knowing the Lord's deep love for his earthly kin, as well as his pain and embarrassment internally, makes some of his actions in mortality clearer. One item of interest is his shift in teaching style. Early in his ministry, he made clear pronouncements of doctrine, teaching the people openly. Then, suddenly, he changed his tactics. He started speaking in riddles, better termed parables. We need to explore this deeper in our Jonah study. Using the Gospel of Matthew as a guide, we can observe that prior to Matthew 12, the Lord spoke to the people in straightforward sermons, such as these. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. 
From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people. Now listen to this clear pronouncement in Matthew 5.17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And note again a short time later. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. So read from these scriptures, he is very straightforward. These aren't parables. He's calling them to repentance. He's telling them exactly what he wants them to know. There's no stories or messages here other than simple gospel truth. It's true. And since his parables are so famous, we don't realize that prior to Matthew 12 in the timeline of his life, he spoke very plainly to the people. Now, something is going to change in Matthew 12 going forward that most Christians miss. So I think you'll find this very interesting. Matthew 12, 22. Then was brought to Jesus one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him. Insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw, and all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? And when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. Okay, here's what changed it. Jesus had just performed a miracle of love and healing as miraculous as any witnessed in Israel's history. It was a powerful day of freeing physical bodies from the prison of blindness, muteness, and deafness. In terms of spiritual healing, he had cast out devils and showed such great power that the people were amazed. Many were convinced that he was the promised liberator, the mighty son of David. It is said that Jesus resembled the royal house, known for their lion-esque coloring and blue eyes. They were truly the lions of Judah. When the leaders of Jewry witnessed these miracles, they could not deny them. But instead of giving the glory to God, they condemned them as magic or tricks of the devil. This was very painful for Jesus. It is also where he was the most emotionally vulnerable. He loved his heavenly father so deeply that he was willing to follow his will through the torturous night of Gethsemane and the humiliating day on the cross. He put up with blasphemies against himself and his disciples, but when he saw his father openly mocked, he took action. Whether it was cleansing his father's temple or defending his holy honor, he was quick to warn the people. Now listen to what he says here. Matthew 12:31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. The Father's power was being manifested before them with every miracle. And while Jesus could tolerate blasphemy against his person, he warned that such willful ignorance in the presence of perfect light would not be forgiven at the great and final judgment day. In addition to announcing that Jesus' spiritual father was Satan, the elders of Israel also began a campaign to question Jesus' legitimacy. Their powerful smear machine had uncovered the inconsistency in the dates surrounding his conception. They had learned of Mary's disappearance prior to consummating her marriage with Joseph the carpenter and her return to society pregnant. Despite the Jewish belief that one's Jewishness comes from the mother, the chance to suggest that Jesus was a bastard was too rich for his enemies to ignore. In all of this, Jesus knew their thoughts and was quick to confound their logic. Matthew 12, 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Behold, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. There are so many accounts of the Lord's brilliant mind in the scriptures. 
The logic of this rebuttal is so profound that it made its way into the modern era. Abraham Lincoln used these very passages to explain the need for the American Civil War. A house divided in two will quickly fall to the ground. The Lord said, if Satan was going about the earth casting himself out of places, he would very shortly destroy his own dominion. Jesus then warned, if he and his authority were rejected, future Jewish generations would see an end to the gifts and fruits of the Spirit. Future Jews would look back along the ages and say, where are the prophets and miracles of our ancestors? Where are the modern Noahs, Moseses, Joshuas, Davids, and Elijahs? Has the Lord of Israel forsaken his chosen? Where are the voices that gathered the animals two by two, that split the rock at Horeb, that hailed the fall of Jericho's walls, that told the skies to hold their reign? Where are the modern prophets of Israel? Yes, that is an excellent question, and I can hear them saying it. Throughout their entire history, they had all these amazing prophets and miracles, and then suddenly, silence. Jesus then threw down this challenge at the same time. Would you read it for us in Matthew again? Okay, Matthew twelve thirty three. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. They, of course, chose to call his fruit corrupt. When the elders were unable to best him in logic, they turned, as Satan had in the desert, to calling for a heavenly sign. Stop and consider the moment for a moment. Our Lord has just exercised demons, healed the blind, and loosed the tongues of the mute, and they wanted a sign. Unbelievable. He had just given them signs. Well, it's no wonder he was so exasperated. No wonder he called them vipers. It was after this event that the Lord changed his teaching style. He would now speak publicly in parables, allowing those with eyes to see and ears to hear to understand him. But before he left these vipers to their fate, he did offer one last sign from heaven. And here it is that we intersect with our Jonah study. Matthew 12, 39. Jesus answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Okay, this is the switch. The only sign that would be given to those who had no eyes to see would be the sign of Jonah. This sign is clear in hindsight. It was simply this, that Jonah's epic experience, which we're going to be studying soon, was a foreshadowing of another, far more incredible journey, one that would break the very prison doors of hell forever and stand as undeniable witness to the nation and the world that Jesus was he who he said he was. Summarized, it meant that just as Jonah's three-day journey to hell and back inside the tomb of a fish's belly had been a sign to all the world of God's power, so the Lord God would pass from the blackness of death into life, raising from the dead after a burial of three days. This is the meaning of the sign of Jonah. But it begs a bigger question. Just how closely did Jonah's experience mimic the Lord's, and just who was Jonah anyway? Well, you know from the scriptures, we don't have a lot of Jonah, do we? Well, Jonah was a mighty prophet and much more famous in his day and centuries afterward than we really realize. He was also feared. It is a shame that his modern legacy has diluted to children's books and stupid sermons about, see what happens when a secular Christian tries to run away from the Lord. I have cringed many times at that silly, ignorant sermon, always illustrated with some bad comic book art. You just can't outrun the Lord, dagnamit. He will always send a fish to outswim you to shore. It is nauseating. Well, if that's all we have, though, how can we teach any more than this? Well, that's a good point. The biblical account of Jonah is sparse. He just appears one day. The fact that Jonah bursts onto the page like Elijah does out of nowhere should be a clue to modern readers of just how famous he was. It was as though the Bible compilers were saying, you know Jonah, who showed up, the famous guy. You are either in the know or you're in the not know. Okay, so they approached it from he was so famous, they didn't need to give any additional background. Where biblical history ends, and so abruptly begins, 
Jewish tradition, legend, and speculation do fill in the missing pieces. While we don't know as much about Jonah as we should, we do know more than what is typically taught about him. Jonah was born in Galilee to a man named Amittai and his wife around the 8th century BC. Jonah means dove in Hebrew, and Amittai means my truth. By all accounts, they were faithful and a believing family. This was something that was not always easy at the time. By the 9th century BC, the 12 tribes of Israel, once united under King David, were divided into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Judah controlled Jerusalem, which was important, as it was still the spiritual headquarters of the nation, being that it was the place of Solomon's temple. Faithful Israelites were required to visit the temple periodically, and so the kings in the north feared that as long as the people looked to Jerusalem, there was a chance that Israel would once again be united under the throne of Judah. From the very start of their division, the northern kings, contrary to the law of Moses, built local altars for sacrifices, appointed non-Levitical priests, and actively encouraged idol worship. They particularly favored the worship of Baal, an early Canaanite god. Omri gained further power by marrying his son, Prince Ahab, to a princess of Baal, the daughter of King Ithobal I of Tyre. She would go down in infamy as the synonym of feminine evil. Her name was Jezebel. Oh, yes, we know her exploits well. When Ahab and Jezebel took the throne, matters got markedly worse. Ahab built a temple for Baal, and Jezebel filled it with a horde of priests imported from her homeland. It is here that Elijah suddenly appears in the Bible with no introduction other than that he was the Tishbite. He warns Ahab that God has given him power over nature and there will be years of cataclysmic drought so dreadful that not even dew will fall on the ground. Elijah's challenge to Ahab is bold and to the point. Baal was the Canaanite god of rain, thunder, lightning, and dew drops. Elijah's power to stop the heavens in Jehovah's name was a direct attack on the very purpose and power of Baal. Elijah was commanded to loose, cut off really, the ten tribes for a time, a very sad calling indeed. These things did not sit well with Queen Jezebel. In her fury, she ordered the murder of every Israelite prophet she could find, particularly Elijah. Elijah went into hiding in the wilderness where, despite his desire to die, the Lord sent him food via ravens. Our focus here is, of course, Jonah, so we have a deep interest in what happens next. Gaining back his will to live, Elijah is sent on a mission. Along the way, he journeys to the Phoenician town of Zarephatho, where he meets a widow. Here is the story from the Bible. And when Elijah came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel, that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but an handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. What a sad story. Here is a poor widow who has just enough food to make one small meal, which she intended to eat with her son, and then starve to death. Well, that is horrible, and you can hear her saying, this is what I'm about to do, and you're asking me of my last food? Well, one cannot help but ponder on the suffering of the people due to the catastrophic drought and how difficult this must have been for Elijah to witness, knowing that he had started it. Still, exercising his faith and asking the woman to exercise her own, Elijah said, Fear not. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. What great faith this widow had, faith that was richly rewarded. She invited Elijah to stay at her home where she fed and took care of him while he performed his various duties in the area. We do not know how much time passed, but on one fateful day, 
tragedy struck. 1 Kings 17.17 17. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. The boy died. And like a good Jewish mother, she let Elijah know how upset she was about it. You can almost hear the pitch in her voice. Listen to this. What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance, and to slay my son? Well, whatever her exact thinking process, she was a widow bereft of her only son, and she was in sorrow, and she was angry. Let's see what happens next. And Elijah said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom, and carried him up into a loft, where he abode, and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord, and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn, by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times, and he cried unto the Lord, and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child, and brought him down out of the chamber into the house, and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Well, now Latter-day Saints might notice the phrase, O Lord my God, and what is to become of the widow's son. This is an important phrase that has to do with martyrdom and death, and may have been the rest of what Joseph Smith was going to say from Carthage Jail. Oh, that's very interesting. This would be the first recorded instance of raising the dead in Scripture. Rabbinical tradition holds that the widow's son was none other than the boy Jonah. Oh my goodness, so that isn't found in the story of Jonah, but in tradition. The rabbis say it's true. Okay. So, Elijah came to see Jonah as somewhat of an adopted son. The symbolic power of this possibility is staggering, both in terms of the Lord's pronouncement that Jonah was a sign, and the public connection between Elijah and later John the Baptist. So, Jonah, his fame as being a child brought back from the dead would have spread and this boy would have been given special attention the rest of his life. Yes, and now note that tradition further says that when Elijah passed his mantle on to Elisha, this new prophet then took Jonah under his wing and called him the student. By now, King Ahab had died, leaving the throne to his son Ahaziah, who was all too easily manipulated by the power behind the throne, the queen mother Jezebel. Ahaziah's rule was short, only a year. During this time, he formed a business partnership with Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, in order to construct a fleet of trading ships. However, this venture proved unsuccessful when a local prophet cursed the endeavor and all the ships sank. A short time later, Ahaziah was injured when he fell from the roof of the palace. The royal family sent messengers to the pagan city of Ekron to ask the idol of Beelzebub if the king would recover. Along the way, they met Elijah, who told them that the king would never leave his bed. He died a short time later, leaving no son to succeed him. The northern crown passed to his younger brother, Jehoram, who ruled for twelve years when war broke out with the Arameans. He was wounded and returned to Jezreel to recover. Ahaziah, king of Judah, who was also his nephew, went with him. The book of Kings recounts that when the captains of the Israelite army were gathered away from their king, the prophet Elisha sent one of his students oh, okay. to the assembly. Elisha's student took one of the captains, a man named Jehu, away from the others and anointed him king in an inner chamber and then departed. Okay. The rabbis say that Elisha's young man here, the student who anointed the new king, was the prophet Jonah. Wow. Okay. Let's continue. With the chosen band, Jehu then proceeded to Jezreel. King Jehoram tried to flee the coup d'etat, but Jehu fired an arrow at him which pierced his heart. King Ahaziah managed to escape but was mortally wounded and died a short time later in Megiddo. Jehu entered the city without resistance. He saw the wicked Queen Jezebel watching him with contempt from a palace window. Jehu commanded the palace eunuchs to throw her out the window, killing her. It is said that her blood splattered down the wall. Then Jehu drove his chariot over her corpse. Later, Jehu sent her servants to bury her. When they went to where her body was supposed to be all mushed into the dirt, all they found were her hands, feet, and skull. 
wild dogs had eaten her, fulfilling the word of the Lord through Elijah many years before. Now master of Jezreel, Jehu ordered the hunting down and murdering of all the royal princes. The next day he found seventy heads piled in two heaps outside his city gate. Ahab's entire family was slain, thus ending the evil house of Omri. King Jehu would soon forge an alliance with Shalemeser III, king of Assyria, officially subjecting his people to foreign rule. This event is recounted on the famous black obelisk of Assyria, which incidentally is believed to be the oldest physical depiction of an Israelite in the world. Sadly, Jehu chose Assyria over the God of Israel. This must have been devastating to the prophet Jonah, who was the one who anointed Jehu as the nation's newest hope. Oh, I could see how Jonah would take that personally, having saved the nation from a wicked king by appointing a new one to then have him turn around and side with their enemies. Now you're starting to get the story of Jonah. Jonah would also aid King Jeroboam in regaining Israelite's coastline by putting a heavenly stamp of approval on the action. Not because Jeroboam or Israel were worthy of the help, but because the Lord felt bad for them, and Jonah was still loyal to his bloodline, if nothing else. These examples mainly serve as proof that Jonah was a much better known prophet than we are left to understand. Due to the wickedness of the kings and people of the kingdom of Israel, the Lord would eventually allow their new Assyrian masters to take them into captivity. They were relocated into the Caucasus Mountains. They would in time become the lost ten tribes of Israel. It would be these same Assyrians that the Lord would soon rebuke by sending them his prophet, the once boy kingmaker and destroyer of Jezebel, the prophet Jonah. Wow, this has certainly given me new insight into who Jonah was. So we are out of time. In our next podcast, I hope, Reed, can we jump into the part about the whale? Oh, let's do the whale next time. Okay. And until then, may the Lord Jesus Christ be with you.